please let me welcome all of you to the first episode in the Leadership and Practice, a digital exchange webinar series, which is hosted by the Midwestern Public Health Training Center. The Training Center and nine other regional public health training centers, 39 local performance sites, and a national coordinating center are all funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration to make up the Public Health Learning Network, which is educating professionals and elevating practice. And this is Lori Walkner, and I'm co-coordinator of the Public Health Training Center. The purpose of these digital exchanges is to provide a conversational format to learn about successes, challenges, and innovation, and innovative practices in applying the five themes of Public Health 3.0. Each of the four episodes then is based on one of the themes that includes strategic partnerships, which is today's theme, flexible and sustainable funding, timely and locally relevant data, metrics and analytics, and foundational structure. And leadership, which is a fifth theme, is really threaded throughout all, each one of these episodes. By providing examples from Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas, we hope to impart some inspiration and guidance toward advancing the mission of Public Health 3.0. We hope these exchanges enhance your leadership skills and personal growth. As President John F. Kennedy said, leadership and learning is indispensable to each other. So before we be began today's program, we'll hear from another leader, Dr. Karen DeSelvo, former Assistant Secretary for Health, who will provide a brief introduction to Public Health 3.0. Well, welcome everybody to this digital exchange on the future of local public health on what we've been calling Public Health 3.0. It's such an exciting time for local public health. It has been innovating and transforming all across the country in an effort to meet the evolving needs of the people that we serve, particularly to be able to better address social determinants of health, challenges that are bigger than any single health department or any single entity that really require the health department to step up as the chief health strategist and bring together partnerships to leverage data in new ways and new sources of data that can tell the story of a community's health and the progress that's being made to make improvements. All of this requires that we're really understanding new flexible and sustainable ways to fund local public health to do the existing work, but also this new work. And then, of course, to really stay focused on the foundational expectations. What is the infrastructure that's necessary to do the core of our work, but also begin to evolve into this new future of addressing uh, broader social determinants of health? You know, when I was health commissioner in New Orleans, we had this very same experience that you all are undergoing and are going to hear more about and, and learn about today. And our pathway was to really transform our local health department into one that could better meet the needs of our community and do that in partnership with others. And it takes a significant amount of change leadership, uh, but it also takes a willingness to really move ahead with partners uh, into sometimes an unknown, an unknown space. I was able to take that experience that I had as a local health commissioner evolve into a new world of public health and define something called Public Health 3.0 in partnership with communities and leaders from across the country. And that vision, that blueprint for a future of public health with those five key areas that you all are all working on, leadership, data, partnership, funding, and foundational capabilities is what we all must together work for to understand the best pathway, the best way to measure success, and most importantly, ways that we can keep it sustainable while we do the, the work of the everyday. So thank you all for continuing to find a pathway forward and to really put community first. So many thanks to Dr. DeSelvo for providing that overview. Today's episode then is on cultivating strategic partnerships and our moderator for today is Dr. Brandon Grimm, who's the director of the Office of Public Health Practice at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, College of Public Health. So at this time, I'm gonna turn the program offer over to Dr. Grimm. Thanks, Brandon. So happy to be here. And as Dr. DeSalvo said, Public Health 3.0 is really important uh, transformative time in public health right now and we believe the Cross uh, structured and cross sector partnerships is one of the most important pieces of Public Health 3.0. And if you're not familiar with what it says in Public Health 3, Public Health 3.0, it says public health departments or public health in general should engage with community stakeholders, 
from both the public and private sectors to form vibrant, structured, cross-sector partnerships designed to develop and guide Public Health 3.0 style initiatives and to foster shared funding services, governance, and collective action. <clears throat> so today, over the next about 40 minutes, 35 to 40 minutes, we're gonna hear from two amazing practitioners in the field to give us some provocative uh, thoughts, to tell us what has worked for them, um, and think about the future of developing these types of structured and cross-sector partnerships. Our panelists today are Jessica Davies, who is the Assistant Health Director and Wellness Coordinator um, at the Panhandle Public Health District in Nebraska. And then also we have Brian Casucci, who is the Chief Program and Strategy Officer at the DeBalmont Foundation. So thank you both Brian and Jessica for being here today. Um, I look forward to hearing from both of you with some of our questions. So I'm gonna turn it over first to Jessica, just to give Jessica, an, uh, allow both of you a few minutes just to introduce yourselves to more than just your title because you're so much more than just a title. So just give the audience a little bit more about who you are, uh, some of the, your background so they can get a sense of where you're from and, and what you do day to day. So Jessica, I'm gonna ask you to go first. Okay, thank you, Brandon. Um, so as Brandon said, my name is Jessica Davies. I'm the Assistant Health Director for Panhandle Public Health District. Our organization is based in Hemingford, Nebraska. We proudly serve 87,000 residents um, spread throughout 12 counties. So our jurisdiction is the size of Massachusetts and Connecticut combined, so about 15,000 square miles. Um, we, have a, we have offices, three offices in our um, jurisdiction that are spread out to effectively serve the population um, well. And I also coordinate, I've been the wellness coordinator, I've grown up here, really. Uh, I, I always, we, my director and I tease that um, I was, you know, just out of high school when I started, but not affectionately teased about that. But we, um, I coordinate the Panhandle Worksite Wellness Council as well. So I've been here about 15 years. And I'm excited to share that uh, what that structure entails and how we've partnered with businesses in that because that really is unique. Um, just a fun fact about me, I am a group fitness instructor and I teach um, an exercise called Town Fit. So it's exercise through drumming. So if you hear me drumming, um, I thoroughly enjoy a little rhythm and music. So excited to be here with you guys today and excited to share. Brian, you're up. So I'm uh, Brian Gastrucci. I am formerly the Chief Health, uh, the Chief Program Strategy Officer for the De Beaumont Foundation. I am now the Acting CEO of the De Beaumont Foundation. Uh, see, Brandon, Brandon has to like get on our listserv for our email, uh, for our newsletter. Um, but coming from a philanthropy standpoint, uh, really my background is in health departments. Um, I've worked at the Philadelphia Department of Health, Texas Department of State Health Services, and the Georgia Department of Health, where I was the MCH and WIC director, I came up through MCH and am now really passionate about workforce since that's kind of all we are. We spend a whole lot of time talking about outcomes, but we spend almost no time talking about how we're going to get there. We're going to get there on the backs of our workforce. So if you continue to ignore that workforce, then you cannot be surprised when we don't have the outcome improvement that we want to see. And so that's from my platform now at the foundation. This is something that we, we talk a lot about. Um, if any of you participated in the Public Health Workforce Interest and Needs Survey, which is the largest survey of governmental public health workforce um, ever, uh, that comes from us. So uh, again, really invested in workforce and really happy to talk about it today. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, Jessica. So my first question is to both of you, and you both you can decide who wants to go first. But my first question is, as it says, Public Health 3.0 challenges public health to form new, out-of-the-box partnerships. And I would argue that we've been communicating this in public health for decades. We've been talking about developing strategic partnerships, collaborating with people outside the box, collaborating with for-profit for business. Um, and I think some of the um, struggles we've had is communicating the value of health to those individuals. So what advice do you have for public health practitioners to communicate the value of public health, communicate the value of health to those outside of the public health sector? And then secondly, to follow up, 
how do you make it a priority for those in the private sector? So how do we make public health or health a priority for those in the public sector or private sector? So <clears throat> Brian, do you want to start us off? Sure. So I totally agree. We've been saying this for a long time and we've been talking about the value of public health and how we articulate the value of public health. I think where we've been short is speaking the language of the people we're speaking to. Um, I mean, I've been married for almost 14 years now, and I don't know if my wife could tell you what public health is. And yet when I go to a business, I, I start talking and we all have done this. You know, we go to the business, we start talking about our home visiting programs and the, the awful health outcomes. And, and we're talking in our language and we need to start to say, you know, what's, What's the whiff up? What's in it for that person I'm talking to? Uh, John Quelch wrote a really great book called The Culture of Health, and it, it frames this up for business. It says business interacts with health in four ways. Consumers, uh, it's the health of the consumers, the health of the employees, health of the community in which the business is located, and the environmental impact the business has on the community. That's the language you have to talk in. And so one of the things that we are doing right now is we have this um, – interesting project and Karen DeSalvo is a co-chair along with Soledad O'Brien um, from CNN, HBO, NBC, etc. And it's called Phrases, Public Health Reaching Across Sectors. And it's a, it's really a communications toolkit for the chief health strategist because I really love Public Health 3.0, I really love chief health strategist, but these are like castles on a hill and no one's ever given us a map on how to get there. And we need that map. So, you know, I'm going to talk differently to the guy who runs the grocery store and who I, you know, if I'm talking to the CEO of Kroger, I need to, which is a grocery store in, what's a good grocery store in the Midwest? Help me out here, Brandon. Hi, V. Okay, so, so that's our grocery store, and I'm going to talk to them. And you know what you have to realize when you talk to them, and I had to learn this when I ran WIC, the margins on groceries is like razor thin. And so one of the main reasons they didn't want to go into some of the low-income neighborhoods was because they were afraid of theft. A little formula theft really can put their lights out. And so I needed to know how to talk to them to get them to invest in this community in their language. If I just told them about the, you know, it was a food desert and that's really bad. Well, yeah, we can morally agree that a food desert's bad, but there has to be some sort of economic understanding that that person's trying to run a business. And so as long as we keep us as the central part, in collaborating with us, uh, you need to learn about us, we're gonna fail. Thank you, Brian. Jessica. Yes, Brian, I could not agree with you more. Um, I have several examples of that situation. So I, my point as well, maybe it's not about communicating health, but, but, but communicating the point of mutual understanding. So how do what we have to offer meet the need, their needs? And for instance, we um, have been working with several communities on walkable community initiatives. And, you know, we come at everything with our public health lens and talk our jargon and say all these things. And we're so excited to share all these things. And they, they don't understand. They're lost in translation. I totally agree with you, Brian. Um, I've said it time and time again. I could tell my husband I save the world every day, but he will always remember through public health that we pick up dead birds. Because um, we do West Nile virus surveillance. So he understands that. He understands that tangible piece. So I always say, what's the dead bird point? Um, and so when when we're, we're communicating with city councils on walkable community initiatives, we've been told at different points, communities um, appreciate it from an economic development lens. And so that's really the angle that we come, come at it from. Um, or maybe some, it might be something on the infrastructure to support the community's aging population. So coming at it from those angles. Uh, another thing that we found is really uh, important, Husker football is huge in Nebraska. So how can we communicate in terms of that? So we have an outstanding program, National Diabetes Prevention Program, outstanding outcomes to it. So how do we communicate that for continued participation in that? We say this program has it's essentially lost the equi equivalent of 30 Husker defensive linemen. That makes sense to people. They say, oh, I get that. Um, and we try to continue to equate that. The bottom line or the bottom dollar is a, a great another example for businesses. However, a lot of the statistics that we get are national or even Nebraska. Sometimes people just can't relate to that. They don't understand what you're saying. Um, so making it in terms of what is very present, very tangible in front of them 
that they can understand too. And can I just punctuate something Jessica said? Um, so I'm putting in the chat box this project that we have called City Health, and it's a policy project. Um, and it's, you know, policy as a prescription for chronic disease. Um, and you can check out the link. The, the real trick here is we interviewed city council members and mayors throughout the U.S. And basically, the, they said health is a slow burn. Health was where it was before I got here. Health was where it's going to be after I leave. I need to worry about jobs and economic development. So they gave us the perfect filter for everything that we had to talk about with city health. And if we're not talking about, you know, if you're talking about things that are going to take 15, 20 years, no politician is, is listening, right? A mayor has two years or four years or six years. And you know, a city council person might have four years, and that's that's the time frame they're working in. And our messaging has to work for that. So, I mean, we changed the city health messaging to building healthy and economically viable communities. And I think that was a much stronger um, messaging platform than, well, this is just good and people should be healthy. Like, I get that. It's a moral <laughs> value for me, but not everyone shares. You know, we have to make sure that we talk to people who share our kind of moral high ground that health is you know, some, everyone deserves, and it's a right, and it should be equitable to those who don't necessarily share that value, but could still really find a way to contribute to us reaching a goal together. Definitely. Yeah, I'm, excited. Great. I'm excited to check out that resource that you shared, too. <laughs> great comments, both of you. I think, yeah, you touched on a point, too, that um, I've been hearing more and more lately. We've heard it, too, is you know, public health, we like to share a lot of data, and we share it all over the place, even with those outside of, um, uh, in the private sector as well, and legislators. And we've heard more and more that the data doesn't always tell the story. So yes, telling the story in their language, I think is so important, because we like our data in public health, but not everyone likes the same data we do. So really thinking about what is the data that they really want to look at. So I think those are really great comments. So thank you for that. that. Um, uh, those of you on the call watching in, please remember if you have questions, you can put them in the, the Q&A box or you can put them in the chat box. We will have time. Uh, we'll have a lot of time at the end of the call for the questions from the audience. So if you're thinking of questions as we go, put those in and we'll continue to monitor those. So my next question is to you, Brian. You are a leader in thinking provocatively. Um, and if those of you who haven't seen Brian, if you have a chance to see him in conference, he's a very provocative thinker. Makes us think differently about the future of public health. So can you talk about what the, really the importance of new and strategic partnerships? Why is this so important? Yeah, um, so I make it clear there are a couple things I want to achieve. I want you to learn something, I want you to think, and I want you to laugh. I don't ever ask anyone to agree with me. And so I have a perspective on public health that is just really honest. And I think sometimes the asteroid is kind of, you know, heading towards us and we're the dinosaurs and we got to figure it out. We either need to kind of go back and eat in the vegetation and wait till it hits, or we can actually be much more proactive than we're being in changing how we do our business, right? And I would like to think that we will do the latter, but it is going to take some changing because let's just, let's together all on this call, just accept there is no more money coming to public health. There's probably less money, there's not gonna be more money. So that means if we're all waiting for CDC to give us money to do the next kind of diabetes prevention program or the next, um, the next hypertension program, it, it's not happening, right? So we have to now really change how we do our work. And, and when you think about the strategic plans that you create in your health department, it's probably more, more of a traditional strategic plan. You know, here's, here's where we are, and we want to accomplish these things. This is how we are going to do it. And we probably think about all the partners that we are going to, you know, engage in our process to get to our outcome. Do you see how self-centered that whole statement was? We, our, you know, et cetera. We have to change to more of a strategic orchestration framework. We have to start thinking about, how we can influence others. So I'm going to give you, this is the, there are two big takeaways for me. This is one of them. We have to change our metric and partnership. Okay. I'm sure every in public health, we have great partnerships throughout the community. 
but it's not the measure is not how many partners you have on your grant the measure is how many of your partners invite you to work on their grant so yes i can get the transportation guy to come to my meeting about you know infant mortality but when they get a bunch of infrastructure funds are they inviting us to come to their meeting and be part of their grant are they putting transportation dollars in the health department so that we can be um, leaders in shaping healthy transportation because healthy transportation is not going to come out of the health department it's going to come out of the transportation department right healthy policing is not coming out of the health department it's coming out of the police department so that's us giving up control and finding the leverage points throughout our community and orchestrating their resources and what resources we have to bring to them. But I think that's a very different perspective than thinking about, okay, how I'm going to engage people in helping me run my program, right? So, so we're going to have to you know, take that leap to, well, this isn't specifically a diabetes program, but this working with um, the Complete Streets group, we actually can get some you know, healthy exercise options available, and that could help reduce the, the incidence of diabetes. Now, that's going to take CDC to giving us some flexibility in our funding so that we actually can work more effectively. And so the funding has to catch up with the need. I also want to share, um, and I think I can do this, a graphic that we use a lot, let's see. Shoot. Yeah. So this is a graphic for what does a public health worker need to be in that public health 3.0 context. And I'm juxtaposing here two sets of skills, specialized skills and strategic skills. Now, specialized skills, this is the stuff that we do and we do really well. Right, we're epidemiologists, we're MCH people, we're chronic disease people, we're, you know, um, whatever your whatever your training, your policy people, whatever your training is, that's your specialized skill. And that's someone who just has this, this kind of vertical line. That's what we'd call an I person, if you just have that vertical line. And these are the people like I, I'm an epidemiologist, so you know, I, I remember those epidemiologists who, and you all know some of them, that you they sit in their office and they run data and every so often you slide food under the door and they slide analysis out and you never really open the door and, and they're happier that way and you're happier that way, right? It's that epi who's brilliant, but they can't really do anything with their data, right? They don't know how to talk about it. They don't have this horizontal bar. They don't have the strategic skill, change management, system thinking, problem solving, right? How many times have we thought, yes, this person's a beautiful, you know, brilliant health educator but cannot solve a problem right and, and i you know i learned this on the job when i was in georgia and was we're meeting with you know people who were the head of large grocery chains and they really didn't care about my epi they really cared about my program they cared about the fact that we had a lot of fraud in our program and we were returning checks for wic and, and that made them really angry and so my specialized skills were not helping me there it had to be all the strategic skills. You know, again, communicating, persuasive communication. Um, and if we, we need to start thinking through when we're hiring people to hire them for those strategic skills. I don't care what position you have that you're hiring for, you should have at least one question on your list of, you know, 10 questions that we get to ask that should in some way get at their, their strategic skill. You know, try to figure out what are those strategic skills that this person in this job needs to know. I mean, someone who is maybe a you know a newborn screening person, um, they're going to have to work with a lot of the nurses in the hospital, uh, in OB, and they might you know really need to get some persuasive communication. Um, somebody who is going to be working in uh, epidemiology around injury really should know about policy engagement right because you know injury epi is, is wonderful and it shows a lot of the places we have some challenges to improve health but if you don't know how to change that to policy then what was the real point of the science so really these are some of the things that that we need to do 
in order to get to a point where we can implement Public Health 3.0. So this, if you if you think about, you know, Karen throwing out Public Health 3.0 as a framework, this is the employee who needs to be in that framework. This is the, these are the skill sets, the complementary skill sets of both specialized and strategic that they're going to need. And again, I, I can't stress enough that how we do partnerships are going to have to change. And, you know, again, take for example, if President Trump dumps a ton of infrastructure money into the country, we are not going to be invited to that party as public health people. But we sure as heck can crash that party. If we have the relationships with transportation and with, you know, street development and all those kinds of folks, all the infrastructure folks, if they know us, if they value us, and they know enough to come to us and say, listen, I don't really know about the health stuff, but I know you do, and can you come help? That's when we've won. That's when we've changed. That's when that asteroid starts to move away, you know, or Bruce Willis gets on it and breaks it in two like he did in Armageddon. All right, that's what happens. If we don't do that, if we continue to kind of focus on our stuff and the partnership, you know, having people come to help us in health and our grant money, I, I hate to say it, but the game's over. The money's not coming. So we need to, and more importantly, all those people who then say, gee, I really needed health for this grant. When businesses say, I really, you know, public health helped me maintain a better workforce. When Jeff Bezos is saying that when I locate my Amazon second headquarters, what I really care about are things like the public health department, having paid sick leave, uh, having paid family leave, that these are, so Austin, Texas, just passed a minimum wage law. Those are the places that we want businesses to, to go to, that health becomes the driver of business relocation. That's when public health will have its renaissance. That's when we will become, you know, really relevant again. But if we continue to just kind of keep our heads down and focus on the programs, I think it's going to be hard for us to really get where we want to get. And it'll be even harder for us to get the life expectancy gains that we had in the last century to repeat themselves. So that's kind of my take. Um, and hopefully at the end, we can talk a lot about this and see if we all agree. Thank you, Brian. Jessica, before I ask you your question, do you have any thoughts or follow up on that? As someone working in you know, public health practice in a local health department in a rural local health department at that? Um, honestly, just letting it all resonate. It was, I, I thought he had so many incredible points with that um, discussion point. And I'm so excited to look further at the graphic that you shared. Um, completely agree, completely agree. So Jessica, question to you now. Um, as you said in your opening, you've had success and Panhandle Public Health District has had success. Um, you are a rural, local health departments. Some of your counties are in frontier, and I know there's a question from one of our students about this, about rural and frontier communities, but you guys have had success with developing these type of out-of-the-box partnerships with the private sector as well. Can you just talk about the process that you guys took and you know some of the successes you had and some of the barriers that maybe came in the way and how you overcame some of those barriers? You bet. Um, so I think really the key with the thought of partnerships and strategic partnerships is um, that fostering and cultivating partnerships is not just a form you fill out. Just like Brian said, it's not how many partners you have listed. It, it is a behavior. It is a, an inclusive, intentional, trusting relationship with an undefined end. Um, each partnership leads to the next in public health, and that path may intersect on any given other project years later each one leads to the next. Um, so creating very long-term uh, strategic coalitions has been something the Panhandle has been good at for actually a couple of decades. Um, we have an organization called the Panhandle Partnership, was, which is the compilation of um, the area healthcare and human service organizations. And so we've worked in that collaborative structure for many years. Um, but then as public health, as we've really tried to be very strategic and reach our community where they're at, um, we've branched out into some different things as well. For instance, like I had talked about, 
I coordinate the Panhandle Worksite Wellness Council. So we work with companies in the area on their wellness initiatives. And it's not programming level initiatives. That's part of it, of course. But it's really um, assessing their population data collection, but then looking at it in terms of policy, system, and environment. Um, just and, and the, the sort of shared understanding, like Brian had alluded to, of those things that um, really are the bottom dollar for businesses in creating a culture of health in their community and what that means. Um, and that's where we've been able, you know, things like healthy vending and walkable campus initiatives and um, trying to think of some of the family friendly policies for breastfeeding, tobacco free campuses, looking at it from that very large structure of what are all the implications. But as we reach that tipping point of uh, businesses, you know, saying this is this is how we do business here. And there's some of the larger em employers. We've seen quite a bit of success. And we know from a rural frontier perspective, it's how we can effectively channel and use our resources as public health, which we know are limited, and channel that through that structure so we can ultimately, we know through that we're able to reach and evaluate at least 25% of our population through that structure. Um, so we're able, you know, we can channel colon cancer kits and all the other things that public health does through that system. And that's worked really well for us. Uh, we have an advisory committee and we have that's represented from the different businesses so we have very small businesses that are represented that are locally you know they're local organizations on up to very large organizations in the transportation industry that also reach out to you know all points in the nation 40,000 plus employers so employees excuse me so that level of conversation and dialogue and partnership with non-governmental you know, entities has been critical to keep that conversation flowing. Another thing that we've done um, for our community health improvement planning, so when um, the ACA had included the requirement of uh, public health planning, or excuse me, hospitals having a work plan for community health, um, we were able to really capitalize on that opportunity and say, hey, we'll help you. Let's do this together, all of us. So we're all saying the same tune. Um, because we're, yes, it's a large jurisdiction, but we have, we're all addressing the same issues. So we partner with our eight area hospitals to do that. And we've done that for two cycles of our community health improvement planning. Um, we just, our last one was updated this last year. So we have a regional community health improvement plan and they have their eight hospital plans. But what's cool from that is that public, we've able, we were able to weave all of our public health initiatives that we know that are coming down the pike or that we, um, through our plan strategically, we want to embed in that and we'll continue to help them with that. So for instance, in a hospital that's 20 miles from here, um, we help to embed walkable community initiatives. One of the things that's included in there is a complete streets policy. So that's very unique to a hospital and we're helping them really start speaking that language. And when we have that unified front, um, I feel like we're going to eventually put those systems in place to avoid the asteroid, as Brian was saying, um, or help ward, ward it off at least uh, when we have those infrastructures and those partnerships really for that effective planning. Um, and we have some other examples as topics are now coming up that we're able to, you know, sort of uniquely partner and address. But like I said, I really want people to understand that it's not a we've got funding for this, we want to partner with this for you, and then we're done, funding's done. This is, we are here, we're going to be with you here long term. My kids go to school here too. We're all in this together. Let's speak the same language. Let's work on this together. Undefined end. Thank you, Jessica. And to go back to what Brian said, because of your uh, work in the panhandle, and some of the work you've been doing, have you started seeing individuals start coming to you outside of those private sectors? Do you, do you see transportation coming to you or did the hospitals come to you because they're, they know, you know, Panhandle Public Health District, they know their things, they know their stuff, we're going to go to them instead of the, you having to go to them all the time? Yes, we, we actually have a great example of a grocer. So they, they, they're an egg cooperative. Um, so they have many different sort of um, services that they provide, but they have a grocery store and convenience stores as well. Um, and one of the things that we had reached out to them and was the um, healthy food in their sea stores. So we started with that. Um, they now did a walkable campus initiative at their grocery store. It's very unique. 
Um, they're really embracing all things public health. They're active in an um, active living advisory committee. They also um, are active in our worksite wellness council. So they're starting to see how it all plays off of one another. Um, and a person that we work with very closely is on the city council for one of the communities as well. And so they also are, in, when we're talking about the walkable communities initiative, they are able to help us sort of met with the messaging at many angles of that as well. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So those on the call, if you haven't been looking at the chat, Brian has been sharing some resources from the graphic that he showed. He offered some resources and websites to the De Beaumont Foundation, uh, some of the different uh, articles. So take a look there if you're interested in some of those different uh, articles. Um, also, we only have a few questions left, the open question time. So be thinking about your questions. I don't have anything on the Q&A uh, chat box yet. Um, and I saw a few in the, in the chat. So, Provide your questions. My next question to both of you, and Brian, you kind of touched on this with your, your graphic, your T-graphic, but <clears throat> part of this, as Lori said when she introduced this, uh, our digital exchange session, part of this is about leadership too. We need great leaders, and that's an overarching theme throughout our four sessions. We need great leaders in public health to continue to carry, carry all of these themes forward in Public Health 3.0. But so what do you think is the role of leadership in the success of uh, the strategic, cultivating strategic partnerships? And either of you can take that. Brian, if you want to go, Jessica, give you a little break. <laughs> um, this, this is a tough question. Um, this is a tough question mostly because when you look at the CEOs of our health departments, they may come to us with absolutely no public health experience. Um, and the physician requirement um, for public health leadership is interesting and something I think we have to struggle with. Um, in San Antonio, they just removed their physician requirement. They had a new health director who was a PhD, and within her first couple of months, she passed Tobacco 21 in uh, the city of San Antonio, which is amazing because Honestly, we have to be thoughtful about who our leaders are in public health. Um, I don't really need to know where my pancreas is to do public health. I need to know <laughs> how to engage community leaders. I need to know how to talk to housing. I need, you know, I think what we need more of is urban planners running our health departments than physicians. And so we need to be thoughtful in selecting our leaders and preparing our future workforce and, and really force the for schools of public health to offer an option of taking an urban planning course or a transportation planning course or, you know, building that skill set far beyond just, you know, the, the disease focus of health. I mean, let's just face it. We need leaders who clearly understand that it's not about bugs and bacteria anymore, that every single conversation about health quickly devolves into a conversation of pills and procedures when we need leaders who will lift that conversation to one about policies and partnerships. And that's the leader we need, the leader who has the courage to say, this has nothing to do with medicine anymore. I am a type two diabetic. I was diagnosed with an A1C of 10.4, which is impressive. You know, two months, I had it back to six because health is a luxury item in this country. And I had all of the things that I needed at my fingertips to be healthy. And we need leaders who are clearly saying, it has nothing to do about medicine, that the multi-year debate that we've had over ACA is a distraction from what is really killing us in this country. We are at a point of being post-medical because it's not, the solution will no longer come from a clinic It'll come from a city council, and the leaders we need know that. And right now, I don't know that that's fully embraced, but by being on this webinar, I know that those people who are participating, the 111 who are here, get that. And so if you can remember one of the things, it's that it is not about pills and procedures anymore. The true solution to health in this country is policies and partnerships, and that's what we do in public health. 
Thank you very much, Brian. As someone educating those future practitioners in the College of Public Health, I couldn't agree more. I am right on, right there with you. Those that uh, your your T going up there uh, to the T and thinking about some of those different skills. Those are really the skills that yes, I agree with you that we need to be educating more and more of our uh, future practitioners. And we actually had a comment in the the chat box from a PhD student. Um, that uh, at the University of Iowa, who also very much agrees with you as well. So thank you for that comment. Um, what do you have to add on there when we're thinking about the leadership side of things? Well, excuse my clapping for right now, but I'm 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 amening and clapping from that. Um, I feel like we are at the pinnacle for lead leadership op opportunities in public health right now, and mentoring is huge. Mentoring in public health is essential. Um, that's really how I feel like we've been successful at our organization is we have many mentors, not just in which, what you'd say public health, it's that whole um, infrastructure and all the egg diagram of partners in that um, from system of care zero to eight, you know, all of those are key pieces in that. So really looking at that from a mentoring perspective and how we need to build that next uh, generation and continue to embed that throughout our systems. Um, very intentional about, about not duplicating. We do not, we, we can't do it anymore. Um, our resource coordination is essential as well. How can you better position a partner to build capacity to address an opportunity? So for instance, um, you have a great grant writer, a training opportunity coordination, data compilation to assist, a great facilitator, um, we have a wonderful in-house facilitator that is used in many aspects for economic development. And so using those partnerships and leveraging that to continue to lead in several aspects, not just under that sort of public health lens, but from all of the aspects of that. And I just really would challenge people that now is when we lead. We must lead now. Um, it's easy to lead when there's like-minded administration, you know, as there was. But now is when we harness the opportunity to share the importance of public health and the many facets that public health, public health entails. Um, keep the conversations going, keep, keep that flowing. Now is when we lead. Thank you very much. Those are both, I think, great advice to, to all of us in public health, so thank you. I'm going to, I have a few questions from our participants. The first one is from Jeannie Bull to ask, what roles do you see for state public health associations, which are nonprofit professional education and advocacy organizations in each state? So what kind of advice do you have for those, our regional or our state affiliated public health associations for thinking about strategic partnerships or even the leadership side of these things? So either of you wanna take that question? I would say they are tremendously valuable um, because they actually get to the real workforce. So when I have an opportunity to go to APHA and talk, I'm talking to a very small number of public health people. When I get to go to a state public health association meeting, I'm talking to people who are actually doing the work because we can travel to those conferences when we can't travel. Again, remember I did 10 years of practice and I remember not being able to go to certain conferences because they were out of state. You have a conference in the state and that's something we can actually you know, really talk about. I, I spoke last year at the Ohio State Health Commissioners Conference, and it was awesome because I got to get up and say, I've watched the conference for a couple of days now. I've looked at your agenda. You have all the CEOs from every health department in the state of Ohio, and you have nothing on this conference about workforce. So I got to then kind of do my workforce shtick for an hour, right? Because that's the, the conversation those people, you know, sitting out in DC, and I'm one of them, we'll, we'll come up with tools and ideas and strategies, but, you know, we're not going to evolve public health. Only, public health will only evolve at the state level, led by state leaders. And the public health association meetings can be a place where you can say my favorite movie line, which is, I'm mad as hell and I'm not taking it anymore. Like, that should be the, that should be the universal theme for every state public health conference in the next two years. You know, that we just need to really think about what it is that we're doing and how we do it. And that's where it's going to happen. So 
you know, I, I'm a I'm a yeehaw for all those public health associations at the state level. Jessica, anything to add? I was just going to say um, definitely communicating from that purple lens, um, not one side or the other, and the importance of that, and making policy level decisions, but making that understandable, because people still have a hard time understanding what that really means and what that looks like. Um, it's been wildly successful for us, and like I've said before, we're really putting those structures in place um, that as we slowly go down this road of public health that we're, we'll ideally see the impact and outcomes of. But um, those are really key, I think, strategies that have been successful and just always partnering um, and really being intentional about your partnerships. But that again, that understanding that it's a behavior. It's not just one thing that you're checking off a list and then you're done with that, that um, organization. It's really that undefined end of partnering. Great. Thank you. I have another question. This one's directly to you, Brian. Are there tools that help translate the expanded strategic skills defined in the de Beaumont from concept to application, measure and building these in our workforce and career development in our existing workforce? So are there, yeah, go ahead. So we're, we are working on this now. Our, the Public Health Wind Survey, which went to 47 states, 96 locals, and had 47,000 responses, asked questions about strategic skills. And we've done a crosswalk between the strategic skills and the um, core public health competency. Um, and so we're going to keep talking about this. And what we just funded a, a $3 million center with ASTO that's really trying to get to strategic skills. Then another kind of great addition to this is the, the HRSA training centers, um, their RFP, the language that they used reflected the language in our national consortium report that I shared about strategic skills. So there is a, a movement afoot to, to try to get more strategic skills in the public health workforce and develop those tools. So I think one of the tools that I'm looking forward to developing is a interview guide that will have questions ready-made that will help you um, ask, you know, in incorporate those strategic skill questions into your hiring process. And so we're working with the senior deputies, we're working with ASTO, um, and this is why I would strongly encourage you to follow ASTO and De Beaumont on Twitter because that's where we put out a lot of our stuff. We just did a really cool report on emergency management legislation and how it failed Flint. Um, and I think there are a lot of people, there are a lot of great organizations making a lot of tools. There's a huge chasm between those of us who make tools and those of us in the public health workforce who wanna consume those tools. And we gotta figure out how better to speak to each other. Great, thank you. So my next question is a question from Barbara Ingebretson, who is at Wayne State College in Nebraska, asking, do either of you have experience with, uh, with or ideas for developing partnerships with volunteer resources in communities, like students, retired people, et cetera? If so, do you have examples or thoughts about assets and challenges on how you manage them? Um, this is from Jessica. I we do have a little bit of experience with that in some capacities, um, in mostly from the emergency preparedness perspective, like our medical reserve corps and volunteer coordination through that. Um, I won't say that we're good at it. <laughs> we have a lot to learn and a lot to um, coordinate with that because as um, people leave and things transition, that's been some difficulty, especially with medical reserve corps. They are now looking at embedding it into um, the local college here, the UNMC, the branch that's in Scotts Bluff, as far as a learning unit. And then, so that would, it would, um, they'd have the capacity built as a student and see that connection to local public health and that emergency preparedness part as well for community health nursing. 
um, but then also that they would um, have them for a short time should they need them to tap into and so they keep that relationship with the instructor. So I think that's maybe a more successful model and maybe more of a system that will be successful for that um, as opposed to what we've traditionally tried in the past. Thank you, Jessica. Mm -hmm. So another question I have um, is from the Iowa Public Health Association, another Public Health Association question. The question is, we have a hard time recruiting public health students into the organization and engaging them in participating in our yearly conference. Any suggestions? Yeah, ask them. Yeah. <laughs> like, simply <laughs> ask them. Why. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I the question is who's going to appeal to the students, right? And I mean, you know, my public health heroes are different from their public health heroes. And who do they want to hear from? And what do they want to hear about? And I think it's just really trying to figure out what's in their brain. And it's really funny. I, I have a fellow with me this year at Beaumont, and we just came back from a conference. And, you know, it was really fascinating because one of the speakers really just went on this rail against millennials, which honestly, if we spoke about a racial or ethnic group the way that we all speak about millennials, we'd all lose our jobs. But they're like the last group that we can make, you know, public fun of and it's okay. And she left the conference feeling really offended because the, the one of the keynotes kind of was dismissive of millennials. And then there was another speaker who was overly clinical. And she's like, I'm an MPH. I'm not a doctor, so this doesn't really speak to me. So I think you got to figure out, you know, what is, I think these are folks, I believe that public health is, for this generation, for this millennial generation, is the, the degree that they're going to because they know they want to make a difference in the world. And so I think they need to be and want to be inspired by their leaders. And we are great scientists, guys. Like, public health, awesome scientists. We are not a great group of inspirational speakers. And so we need to find like that, you know, that Venn diagram of really good speaker, really good scientist, and kind of find the, the person who's in that middle, um, because that's the only thing that's going to get these folks coming to the meet. So I'll tell you someone I do a lot of work with now, which I think is wicked cool. Um, I do a lot of work with Soledad O'Brien, um, like HBO, CNN, Soledad O'Brien. And I reached out to her and we've been to know each other. And so now I have heard speak at some conferences that I've been involved with. Um, and it's been great. She's been a great draw. I've had more business people. Um, Kansas City Chamber of Commerce, Scott Hall, just a, a business guy and a chamber of commerce. He blew them away at NATO because he was able to tell them something they didn't know. Right? He's like, this is how you got to talk to me. And I think when you really get speakers up there who can um, give you something that you didn't have, then it's really important. And someone who gets up, and I've seen these talks, we've all seen these talks, with the guy who's like, here's a graph of my research, here's a graph of my research, here's a graph of my research. And you just, trust me, if you wanna jump out of the window, everybody else does too. And we just have to work beyond that as our go-to speaker. Thanks, Brian, and I would add to, um, success we've had in Nebraska. If you work with work with some of your schools of public health, colleges, public health and programs, uh, that's what our state association did. They worked with us as a college public health and we started funding a lot of our students to go to the conference, which this is just a, I agree with Brian, it's more important to have a really good agenda and really good speakers, really good sessions for them and not offend them. That would be a good start. But also working with your colleges of public health too to think about how do, how do they promote getting students to the conference? Uh, because a lot of colleges don't even think about that. Um, thinking about how we actually promote to get the faculty of colleges of public health there as well, because then they will promote and have, uh, see more value in it to their students. So I think that's uh, another good way to start thinking about how we get the students to our uh, association meetings as well. Good question. So we only have about five minutes left. Um, I have one final question here that says, has there been conversation and support from the Public Health Accreditation Board in this effort? So I'm guessing the effort is, yes, yeah, strategic partnerships, um, 
So I know, Brian, you're very, very familiar with the Public Health Accreditation Board. Jessica, I know you guys, you are accredited health department in the state of Nebraska through FAB. So both of you might have uh, some comments on this about conversations and support from FAB. Well, I yes, gotta be honest, you, sir. Well, I was just going to say, I got to be honest that that was one of those things that um, it's like uh, pregnancy and giving birth that you don't really want to reflect back. It's just like a happy memory. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, yes, it was an integral part of it. And I was very proud that we had the examples that we did. And I know our director was too. Um, the leadership that we have in our health department with our director, I feel like she's given us that direction. She set us up for that for years to come. And as she, as we've continued to watch this and watch 3.0, I mean, we've, we're really embracing that chief health strategist um, role, really. That's what we've, we've embedded it in our latest strategic plan and as a health department um, because, of, because of that and knowing from the, the FAB um, standards is important, but it, it's just overall important. It's why we've been successful. successful. I, I would say that there is the health departments that have chosen to do accreditation say less about accreditation and more about the leaders of those health departments. And so I think this goes right back to leadership and how we orient new leaders in public health. Um, I wanted there was a previous question from a, a, a PhD student um, that I thought was really good about how do we make folks how do we teach folks to be these strategic thinkers? And I think that is, that's a question for an academic like Brandon. Um, but uh, this, I just, I'm just happy when we start to have the conversation, right? Because public health can get overly stagnant, um, especially given the government restrictions that we have. Um, so the things we can and can't talk about. And, but we, we need to be very thoughtful about, you know, why you got into this work to begin with and, and what your goals are and being that leader you know I think the first step is being the leader that you want others to be and sharing the resources that we've talked about on this call sharing resources from other call be that annoying person in your workplace that's always giving my wife does this everywhere she goes she drops articles off on people's desks and um, mostly she annoys people but then they're always like oh you're the one who left that really interesting article on my desk. Like, be that person. We have to be the change that we want to be. And so I think that from an accreditation standpoint, as there are more leaders who demand changes in accreditation to bring into this T perspective, the more accreditation will respond. But it really starts with our leadership, us, and the giant group of millennials who are coming up who will run these health departments in not too, too short a time. I agree, thank you. So we have a few more questions, but we don't have time. I'm going to, do either of you have final final remarks, just final closing remarks that you'd like to, wisdom that you wanna give to our students, our practitioners, uh, anyone on the call with us? Our inspiration. <laughs> um. You know, my resonating point, I included it in the leadership section when I talked about that, but um, on question number four, but really that I had a dear friend that I, as administration was changing and I was very somber and I thought, oh, what do we do now? And, and, and she said, now is when you leave. It was very easy for us. We, we need to embrace this now, Jessica. Now, now is the time. And I thought, okay, you're right. Put your boots on and let's go. Yeah, I think I um, I draw most of my inspiration from movies, which is a challenge because my movie lexicon is not keeping up with with my younger colleagues' movie lexicon. But um, in Shawshank Redemption, they make a very simple point of you you get to live in or you get to die. And I honestly am fine if you don't think any of what we talked about is relevant and you want to choose get to die in, just stay out of our way. And let those of us who really want to evolve this public health workforce, let us work. And I think if you also go to The Untouchables, which was a really good movie, that's when Kevin Costner used to be a good actor. He did The Untouchables. And there's a simple question about, you know, you had a character in there who had been shot and he was dying. 
and he asked the simple question, what are you prepared to do? And, and I asked the students, I asked you, um, so I love this question here about many programs that are equipping students um, to become strategic professionals, hence we'd be vertical specialized thinkers. I totally agree with you, uh, Pamela, but um, what are you prepared to do about it, right? Remember this country when we used to take on major things and change the world? We've lost that somewhere. We gotta get it back. We have to get the, the courage to change um, what we can. And that's, um, that's what I really wanna leave you with. Um, and either make your choice, get to living or get to dying. I just hope you choose living. Thank you, Brian. Thank you both so much uh, for your time. Thank you all that were on the call. I'm gonna turn it back over to Lori Walkner uh, with the Midwestern Public Health Training Center, and she's gonna close us out. So thank you both so much uh, for giving us an hour, and thank you all that were on the call for giving us an hour. This was a great discussion. I think it was a great kickoff and start to our digital exchange, um, and we have more coming. So Lori, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Brandon, and thank you, Brian and Jessica. This was just a great energetic and very thoughtful discussion that hopefully we'll be continuing on for the next four weeks in these, with the other themes of Public Health 3.0. And I just want to thank also our audience for joining today. In the next few days, you'll receive an email including the links to the archived webinar, which will be posted on our website at www.mphtc.org. And we'll also have all of those great resources that were mentioned today, the book and the graphic that Brian had, um, and we'll put those all um, so that they're accessible to you. Um, also included in the email will be an evaluation that we hope that you will take just a few minutes to fill out. We use these evaluations to enhance the future webinars that we provide. Um, and we hope that you'll join us next week on Thursday, March 22nd, at 12 o'clock Central Standard Time for the second episode in the Leadership and Practice Digital Exchange series. And that, was in, that one is entitled Sharing Outside of the Box, where we'll hear more about flexible and sustainable funding efforts. So again, thanks to everyone um, for joining, and we hope that you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>